Hi everyone, I'm Hannah, you're welcome to my allotment. I'm currently in my greenhouse, my large one, with all my seedlings and you can tell without me telling you that it is <laughs> full on spring now and we're getting run over by all the seedlings that want to go out but cannot do so yet because of the weather and wow, the weather is so cold this year. So as a reference, my allotment is based outside Oxford, UK and here we have temperate oceanic climate and our last frost date is mid-May. And temperate oceanic means mild winters and cool summers. This spring, however, has been quite chilly and we still have frost nights. I mean, it's nothing unusual, but it's just very, very cold, very, very cold. And I've heard stories of people's broad beans freezing to death of people's peas freezing to death outside you know that those are quite quite extreme examples for the UK anyway I know across the world obviously you get much colder weather but it's maybe more so this year than is the norm and it's had some noticeable effect on seedlings specifically growth I think things are growing quite slow I was touching on this in my last vlog and uh, yeah the more I talk about it, the more people agree with me that it is very slow this year. So we've had a stretch now of I don't even know how many nights, but it's been a frost every night, probably for the last week almost. The coldest we've had in this greenhouse was minus 3.1 and the other greenhouse actually last night was colder than this one. So I've been trying to decide which is the colder one of the two and I thought it would be this one, but it, apparently it's not because I'm hoping at some time soon to be able to move my tomatoes out into the greenhouses. They will be inside a little greenhouse inside the greenhouse and they will be protected with extra fleas and I'll, uh, if it gets really cold, predicted really cold, like minus three, I'll put in a hot water bowl inside their little house, right? But I'm hoping to be able to move them out this weekend because the temperature looks like it might be switching. So I'm excited for that. But for now, we're still in this week's vlog, um, but that will probably be coming up in the next ones. Anyway, this week I did quite a few things, obviously the usual stuff, pricking out, sowing more seeds, planting out. So let's get into it. Let's see what I get up to. So, well, first up, I had great germination on my celery and my celeriac. So I sowed those a couple of vlogs ago and it's important to sow them on the surface of your compost because they need light to germinate and also then to cover the tray with some plastic or in a propagator lid or something like that because otherwise they risk drying out really quickly especially if you're germinating them in a sunny windowsill when it gets quite hot but they're germinating fine absolutely excellent and uh, I like to prick them out as soon as the two true leaves have fully folded out as usually as usually how I treat all seedlings that I try to prick them out as soon as they've folded out obviously when it comes to tiny seedlings like celery and celeriac it can be a bit tricky and I totally understand if people are not comfortable pricking out those minute seedlings but trust me it does work and if you do them small they're actually more likely to survive the transplant shock that it really is a is an effect of damaged roots from the root disturbance that you, you perform. So when they're smaller, they have a single little root and you're less likely to damage it than if it has a branched out already in a, as a whole system, you see what I mean? So if you just have one, it's very easy to just prick a hole and, and put the seedling in. And uh, let's have a look at them, they're right here. And this is them today. I don't know, yeah, the seed tray is still full. Uh, the last row is actually Hukatai black mint, so it's not celery celeric, but so far the seedlings look almost exactly the same. Um, but yeah, uh, actually it needs a water. So important thing with celery celeric is not to overwater at seedling stage, because then because they're so small, I don't know, they just risk uh, getting too wet and experiencing dampening off. I'm gonna put the tray in water now, and then must not forget to take it out. <laughs> That would be bad. So celery and celeriac are 
those kind of veg that you really invest your time and effort into because they take so long to grow from seed to seedling. Oh, it's actually raining now? I mean, it's only like a tiny, tiny, tiny drizzle and the sun's, sun's still shining. Uh, April, eh? April. But yeah, they take a long time to harvest, but it's definitely worth it, in my opinion. It is getting a little bit late to sow them now, but you know, with gardening, everything's worth a go. And if nothing else, you learn a lot from trying to grow them the first year. So definitely have a go if you haven't already. But just bear in mind that next time, next year, start earlier. I'd say by mid-March is a good time to start. So then I also had my lettuce I sowed in February has been in the greenhouse since it germinated and through the cold weather have grown quite slowly I thought but they are definitely ready to be planted out now this week so it's good because as soon as you start planting out you immediately make space inside the greenhouse so it's important to keep that momentum up to keep planting out so that you have space to sow new seedlings seeds so that you keep the to keep the ball rolling otherwise it, it can feel like um, you're not getting there, you know, like uh, things that you want to sow but you just don't have any trays or whatever, it's holding you back and in the end it means that uh, you might struggle to fit everything in time-wise, you want to sow things in a timely fashion. Obviously we all struggle with this but it is good to bear in mind that a lot of early sown vegetables are frost tolerant, including lettuce. So Everything I planned out, obviously I cover with fleas and uh, this is a thicker 30 gram fleece, that's what's necessary, not the flimsy stuff because it only lasts a season and it's it's a plastic goods that you're buying so you want to make sure you buy good qualities, you only have to buy it once or, or rarely have to rebuy, you know. And I usually don't put the fleas on hoops or anything like that because it actually increases the risk of damaging the fleas and the plants don't need it. They can grow and push it up and you slowly uh, release the tension on it on the stones that you have weighing it down and it's totally fine. The one exception is obviously if you're predicted snow, heavy snow, right? And uh, if it is hard, hard frost like minus six or or for long periods of time, where the fleece t touches leaves, they can g get damaged, right? But it's a usually superficial damage, and the plant will recover if the heart, if the if the core of the plant is alive, they'll keep start growing again. So things I've planted out, obviously, are salads and lettuces. Still have to do my spinach, actually. I just didn't have time, but they are more frost hardy than salads, or most salads, I should say, lettuces. I've got my tall peas out, I've got my calabres, radishes, turnips, peas for shoots and um, beetroot already. And quite a lot is ready to go. I've got another tray of brassicas and all sorts of stuff. So what I'm trying to say is I like, don't hold back, like don't, don't plant out because you're worried about the frost killing your, your brassicas because it's most likely it won't. However, what I'm not including here are Cucumbers, beans, tomatoes, chilies, peppers, aubergines, squash, any of these, they will die because they do not have the frost protection that the winter hardy vegetables have, right? So it's not worth maybe even bringing them out to your greenhouse unless you, you provide extra protection there and even then uh, it's a bit, it's a little bit risky. There's no way that you can harden them off. So I read a great post about this from so much more on Instagram where she's talking about like some plants just lack that uh, capability of increasing sugars in their cells and protect them from frost that way. So for example, t tomatoes cannot do that. So if they're exposed to frost, their cells uh, will freeze and when water inside cells freeze, it expands, right? And that breaks the cell wall and there's no recovery from that. Compared to if you have a, a plant that can increase the sugar content in their, in their cells, it means that they can 
sugar crystals in water means that it reacts differently, right? I mean, uh, I'm not a chemist, but I'm a cancer researcher. I know a little bit about cells, right? But <laughs> And I don't know anything about plant science. Um, but yeah, that's my science bit. So anyway, there's no way you can harden off sensitive plants. Like, there's no way that you can teach a tomato plant to respond okay to frost. You know, there, there's, there's, uh, there's, uh, yeah. And talking about f hardening off, it's also a waste of time if you're talking about frost hardy plants. The thing that you might struggle with are plants that have been grown inside your house, maybe not even on a Sunday windowsill. So if you move them straight out into bright sunlight, they might struggle from that because the light is so strong and they're not used to it. Uh, they might change color on the leaves, they might darken, um, they might even get sunburn. You know, so that's one thing to bear in mind in spring, but things that are in your greenhouse, like uh, brassicas and all that, even sweet peas, you can plant out because they're fine outside, they can survive it. So, sorry, we were talking about lettuces anyway. I plant out my lettuce and I grow them to pick out the outer leaves, right? And I do that because you get a longer cropping season. You can wait wait and wait and wait for them to heart up and then you can cut the whole heart but then you also have to use a whole heart and for me i don't use a whole head of lettuce in a salad bowl usually so it's much better for us as a family to just pick the outer leaves of however many plants that you want to pick from however much you need that day and you get it fresh that day or you can even pick wash the lettuce put it in a bag or a container inside your fridge close the lid sort of with a little gap and the water on the lettuce will keep it crisp in the cold in the fridge for like a week so that way I think it works much better and the, they will grow quite quickly now and as soon as the plants next to each other I plant them out about 20 centimeter distance as soon as the outer leaves of the neighboring plant start touching each other you know it's time to start picking and you leave maybe like the inner rosette of the plant and that's fine because that's where the photosynthesis is happening. You're not hurting the plant, you're not stopping the growth. If anything, you might speed it up by encouraging it to start developing. The other positive thing is that if you keep picking the outer leaves, they don't, because there's a natural process to the whole thing, like the, the lower leaves, the bigger leaves will reach the end of their life and they'll start to yellow and then they'll fall on the ground and that will attract the slugs. So by constantly picking and harvesting your lettuce it's around like that, you will keep the slugs at bay and you know have a a, a very very crisp and whole free lettuce harvest through the season. So these will obviously start flowering when we get into summer, and I will replenish these plants that I've planted out now from sowing. So I'm going to make in June. But now in spring is definitely the 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 height of the season for lettuce in my opinion and we're gonna have some great crisp leaves very soon oh while i have your attention please give this video a thumbs up if you're enjoying it or if you're learning something from it it's really good to let me know i'm doing something right and uh, yeah back to enjoying the video so i've also sown my sunflower seeds I couldn't wait any longer and it's gonna be exciting. I mean, I love sunflowers. I'll talk a bit more about this in my uh, what I'm sowing, what flowers I'm sowing now video. I'll put a link up here if you wanna check that out. But basically, I'm gonna go big on flowers and it's gonna be amazing. I decided to sow my sunflowers in modules because I had so many varieties and space is limited and I wanted to bring them inside the house to germinate because that's what I always do and I find that's more reliable because the temperature is the same uh, throughout the day and night and this speeds up germination. They would germinate fine in a greenhouse or even outside if you're direct so right but to speed things up I, I did that and to be able to do that uh, they had to be in a module tray. Yeah they're just over there now they started poking out and that's the sign that you want to move them out of your dark house <laughs> and out into the sunlight so that's where they are and as soon as they've come up I can pop each module out of the one that was ready and plant that up and that way I've saved myself some space early on in the stage and hopefully I've planted more stuff out so I have more shelving space to keep them inside the greenhouse because sunflowers, the giants at least, they grow fast don't they? They shoot up really quickly and you want to keep on top of 
planting, uh, changing the pot size for them, right? So, you know, <laughs> uh, the best success I've had with sunflowers is direct sowing, so maybe don't listen to me 100%. <laughs> but that's my plan, that's what I'm doing this year anyway. We'll see how it works, eh? The next thing I sowed was actually cucumbers. So I'm growing two varieties of cucumbers inside my greenhouses. Uh, Passandra and Femspot, they are both F1 varieties and I loved them last year. Femspot is a massive cucumber uh, which then produces fewer, whilst Passandra is a, a shorter uh, but more prolific variety. And yeah, they were great for me last year, so I've sold the rest of those packets. Because they're F1, you get less seeds in the packet, so I only had three of one and two of the other. But I was, uh, so it's a little bit hesitant. So I'm growing these for the Grow Along for Life I'm running. It's a, a Grow Along that's run through my mailing list and you can sign up via the link in the description of this video. There's still time, we're doing one or two vegetables a month and you get an email just with my instructions of how we do it and then following my vegetables through from sowing to harvest. Well, that's the plan anyway, I haven't harvested anything yet. Though I think pea shoots from February will be ready now, yeah, start picking. Obviously not big harvest yet, but you know. And uh, the cucumbers, I actually looked at them. I was a bit nervous that they weren't gonna come up. Um, but yeah, I saw at least one of each coming up, but I think I might need to get more seeds of these just in case. So I was hesitant to start growing them. My plan was to not start cucumbers until the end of April or May early May, um, but yeah, since I only had a few seeds, I thought I'd get them on, and if I need more, then I can buy more seeds. So I did, um, did manage to finish working with the strimmer and cleared up the grass around, it's the thick, thick grass around my strawberries and my raspberries and the, the, the purple sprouting broccoli bed. So I ended up with uh, quite a lot of mulch, grass mulch over the raspberries, so I hope they like that. Unfortunately, uh, I think I managed to damage some of the raspberry shoots as well. <laughs> Seriously, my summer fruiting raspberries, they're, they're, they're not doing well and um, I don't think this made it any better. <laughs> but anyway, we'll see. And then I had my allotment helper here and we actually mulched the whole of the mound. I had more compost delivered and I know I needed to mulch that because it's just uh, clay topsoil heavy clay topsoil and uh, and I already grew stuff on it last year so it needed to have more nutrients and needed to have uh, a mulch there to improve water retention because it's raised as well and it's clay. Clay is so weird like either it's too wet or it's too dry there's like no in between with that so if I keep mulching it the area will be excellent you know. So no dig works really well for flowers too. Yeah I'm pretty pretty excited for this season. And then that evening I was like looking at the sky and it was wow it was so, they was spectacular like whew, you could really tell something was going on and we had we'd had snow flurries these like it was almost like like miniature hail kind of like you know that really frozen snow coming down so I was not expecting to wake up to a, a like a thick layer of wet snow the next morning. It was insane. It was insane. It came out of nowhere. So that day when we were mulching, it was so hot. And you know, I was down into just a single layer. I'm a layer kind of person. I have like three layers on now. <laughs> so I was down to a single layer. And um, yeah, so it was a shock to the system to see all that snow. Thankfully, because the days are quite warm, because we're in April now, so the snow melted really quickly, and it actually ended up being quite a good layer of moisture everywhere, especially on the mulch, it worked out quite well, because it had rained, it was okay to mulch, and because I wouldn't, I didn't want to mulch the flower mound it was, if it was like bone dry, because then you can sort of exacerbate it and make the problem worse. You put a mulch on, and then actually there's no moisture coming down into the, the soil underneath. But this way, it, like, it, it rained before I put the mulch on and then that thick snow and it's, yeah, it's properly wet now, so that's good. Because we have not had any rain, like proper rain. It's been maybe one or two days since beginning of March. It's not good, actually. I mean, we're already 
entering the dryness of the season here so but yeah thankfully that snow was gone fairly quickly i also sold my second lot of tomatoes and these are the ones i'm planning on growing outside in the beds so i sowed them by beginning of april right and uh Wait, are we still in the beginning of April? Yeah, sort of, in the second week of April. And they're starting to come up now. Sun Gold, as always, is the first one up. So I'm growing Sun Gold both inside my greenhouses and outside in the beds. It is a really good performer, Sun Gold. If you haven't grown it, you have to grow it because <laughs> the tomatoes are excellent. And it's uh, quite frost hardy. And uh, <laughs> even after what I said before, it's okay, I should say maybe it's cold tolerant. It's quite blight tolerant and it's just a very very good performer it's just really really good it's nothing wrong with it apart from that it's an f1 variety which means that you can't save the seeds from it or and expect a true variety to come out of it unfortunately so that's the negative you have to keep buying new seeds of it but people do because it's so tasty <laughs> so i saw my melons at the end of march and i was so excited so excited because, oh, yeah, I mean, I haven't had great luck with growing melons, but usually I can bring them up to seedling stage really successfully. However, this year, not so much like with most other things this year, growth, germination has been very, very slow. And uh, to the point where I was get, beginning to despair. But then a few started popping up, but only one in each pot. I uh, sowed three seeds per pot, except the one pot, um, which had two. So and they were the first to show up as well. So those two I had to split. As soon as you see the bead of the third leaf, the first true leaf come out between those two seed leaves, it's a good time to repot any cucumber, any family member of the cucumber squash group, right? That's a good time to do it. So mine were a little bit older and had a slightly bigger roots, which meant that they were slightly more affected by the transplant shock, but they're okay now. However, I still was experiencing really poor germination in my melons, so I started to have a dig around. Shock horror, but we were getting quite late, and either these kind of seeds germinate or they rot, so I was a little bit suspicious that they'd rotted. I've never really had that problem before, so I was a bit surprised, but yeah, I was digging about, I got a seed out, and it had opened, but it had gone like yellow, and when I actually opened the seed up, you know, they, they split open and then the root comes out first. So done that, but no root to come out. So I opened it and inside there is like, it's full of fungus gnat larvae. And I don't know if you've experienced this too, but it, the problem seems to be widespread this year. Everyone has problems with fungus gnats. Uh, so you can usually see them buzzing about your, your uh, plants inside and especially when you're growing tomatoes, chilies, and all that sort of stuff, there's usually fungus gnats inside your house, right? But it's never been this bad to the point where they're eating my seeds, you know? I'm very, very upset about that. So that explains why so few of the seeds have germinated. So it probably means that my compost has been infected or that I have had a plant come into my house that is already infected and it's spread really fast. So they obviously like moist conditions, warm conditions. So in your house with wet compost, it's like perfect. And it's a continuous life cycle. You know, it's very, very short between the fly laying the eggs and each fly can create 200 larvae. And then they create, you know, a fly that can create 200 larvae. So just, you know, it's never ending, right? And I have these sticky traps and usually that's enough to control the population, but not this year. So yeah, it's not good. So they can also eat the decaying roots of your plants. So <clears throat> if you have any problems with your plants, the fungus gnats will make it worse. And also then eat your seeds, which isn't great. So I've ordered some nematodes as well and uh, I will use them to get on top of the situation and I won't sow any more melons or squash or cucumbers before then and my cucumbers, the ones I only had a few seeds off, I think they're affected too because only one in each pot has come up so I haven't dug around and checked but seeing as they're growing next to each other as the melons, I'm assuming it's the same problem. So. 
I'm theorizing here, but I'm thinking the mild winter we had last year will have affected the compost you're buying this year. So if you imagine if it's not been cold enough, things like this will have survived in the soil or in the compost it, to a much larger degree than they would maybe normally do. So we might all be experiencing this problem because a lot of the compost supplied will have the fungus nuts, eggs or pupae in it, unfortunately. And that might be the reason why. I mean, I, I have no scientific proof of this or anything like that, but that's the theory I have and why it's so bad this year. So nematodes, they're safe to use on plants that are intended for human consumption. Uh, I'll put some links down below if you fancy having a look at them. So in my last vlog as well, I was talking about my loofah seedlings and how I was so worried about them. So repotting them has helped. I repotted them in a sandier mix of compost. And yeah, they're all actually recovering. So I have four seedlings there. And um, they, when I looked at those roots, I don't know if you remember, but I told you they were starting to get a little bit eaten. So they probably had the fungus nut problem as well but repotting it in fresh compost will probably have helped them recover and now they're actually growing so i'm hoping that that will be enough to then get them going to the point where they're big enough that they're fine i mean this is me hoping here anyway so i started six more seeds right and they all germinated and i've all put them up and they've all come up now so so we are <laughs> we are maybe being overrun by lufus but that's a good problem to have seeing as they are so finickety anytime you repot them you risk losing them right so as once they're in their final position maybe i can breathe a little bit easier <laughs> uh, unless i overwater them but yeah so we're getting there we're getting there and then my my second early potatoes and my main crop potatoes have finally got in the ground and what a milestone. <laughs> so I've gone for one variety of second early Charlotte, which is great for taste and great for yield. And you can harvest it from midsummer for as a second early. They will be ready then, but you can also leave them in the ground and they will keep well and harvest them as a, a little bit later in the year for maybe a larger potato and they will also keep over into the colder months as a main crop you can even keep them and sow your own seeds for next year obviously you can do that with any potato but charlotte is a good one to try with and that's what i'm going to do if i get enough or if as hopefully we don't eat them all right and then i have three main crop pink fir apple which is which i've wanted to grow for ages right um but it's always just been sold out when I've been buying seed potatoes. So now I've got mine. They're like a, a nutty kind of uh, potato maybe that you you wouldn't make roasties with. But it would be great, I think, just boiled or uh, in a potato salad, cold potato salad or anything like that. So yeah, I'm pretty excited about that one. I'm not so sure my partner is, but I am excited about that one. It's the type of potato I like. So that one is an older variety and it takes a long time to mature. So it'll be end of summer because it's a main crop maybe into autumn. And that means that it, it is at a higher risk of blight affecting it. The longer the season is, the higher the risk of blight because usually the blight weather happens in August, right? So I'm also growing Sarpo Mira, which is the Sarpo varieties are usually more resistant to blight. So that's a good one if you are worried about that and i'm also growing king edwards so those are you know a great roasty potato and we'll see yeah so i'm also sowing so sorry i'm also planting a few of each of these varieties in bags just like i did with the the first early varieties so i can move them into a greenhouse if we predicted a really late hard frost just in case so i don't lose all so I'm, i have given space in one whole bed in my original vegetable area for potatoes this year i know every time every year i say oh i'm not gonna grow i'm not gonna give that much space to potatoes but then you know they're such a great crop so it's good to have your own potatoes and it's nothing tastes better spacings i've gone for i think about 40 centimeters for the second earlies you can uh, go down to 35 or up to 45. 
uh, that will have an effect on your yield. Obviously, the small, closer the spacings, the smaller the plant, less nutrients, less water, and you'll have a smaller yield. But but um, if you don't mind small potatoes, that's not a problem. You can cram more in, and maybe overall you get more than if you kept the distances but planted one less. If you see what I mean. So you know, make the judgment on what space you have and then the main crop you can go from 35 centimeters to 45 centimeters to 60 centimeters and if you go 60 centimeters you're obviously maximizing your crop and get those really, really big potentially baking tomatoes t tomatoes baking potatoes and all that so it all depends on what you want and maybe you can grow some a bit closer and some a bit further apart and you get a big selection or a larger selection of sized potatoes if that's uh, what you're funding, you know? <laughs> Are there any spud aficionados out there? So my plans for the weekend will be to repot my first sown tomatoes. They're ready to come out of their modules now. And then I'm thinking about moving them, when they're in their pots, moving them down to the greenhouse. Wish me luck with that. And then I need to start with my dahlias. So I'm going to record an unboxing video and a planting up video for those. So check out those coming out next week, hopefully. And uh, yeah, that's it. I hope you have a great weekend and I am excited to get out to the plot all day, all day. I'm so excited. It's going to be good. <laughs> Weekends are the best.